from Gilad, India. Our third speaker, Mr. Maui Sanford, is not physically present, but he will be contributing remotely from Tahiti in French Polynesia. Mr. Sanford is also the president of PETA, and he extends his apologies for not being able to be with us here today. And now we'll give them one or two minutes to quickly introduce themselves and the uh, organization. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, greet you in some of our island language. From where I am, I would say uh, Ali, Kiorana, your run name, Kaselelia, and finally Bula. Welcome to the session. Uh, as Fred mentioned, um, the islands uh, is so isolated, and, and we appreciate your participation in this uh, workshop this morning. Uh, where I come from is uh, a small group of islands in the western region. And on the map, you can see that towards the Philippine side, it's Palau Islands Group. Yep. And uh, it's a um, bit, bit, bit of history. Uh, it's comprised of about 22,000 population-wise. Uh, most uh, known uh, industry there is tourism. We are known for our uh, abundance of uh, environment, clean waters, and scuba diving, as well as uh, fishing industry. Migratory fish is one of our uh, big industry as well. So without further ado, I will uh, give the floor to uh, the next uh, speaker. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Praveen Sharma. Uh, I represent uh, Gilad Satellite Networks. Uh, I am working there as Director of Technical Marketing. Uh, Basically, I am from India. I am based out of India, but uh, we do a lot of business. We have a lot of networks in Pacific Islands, and we have an office in Australia which takes care of that particular region. Uh, uh, now I'll hand over the floor to Fred. Thank you, Praveen. Um, Maui, can you hear us? Can you introduce yourself quickly to the audience? Okay. So without further uh, detailing this, I will come back later on. I will uh, let everybody to move on um, on the key of the topic. Thank you. Thank Th you. Thank you, Maui. Um, for those who just come in, uh, that was Maui Sanford, the president of Peter, reading remotely from his home country in Tahiti, French Polynesia. So you will see here we have only a few speakers, unlike some other sessions. And a uh, few reasons for that. Uh, the first reason is that it's quite costly for, for us in the Pacific Islands to travel to this far end of, of the world. And that's one of the reasons why we, we appreciate Gillet um, enabling Mr. Praveen to join us. Second reason is that uh, in the Pacific Islands, our resources are quite limited, with one person doing numerous number of jobs, so they're quite multi-skilled as well. Having them out from the job uh, is quite a challenge for us. And thirdly, um, we would like to give more time to the audience to contribute, give us some ideas, and also suggestions on uh, how we can move this uh, forward with access. So I, I encourage you all to to 
give this session your full support and your attention. Now the outset from space, from Google Earth. The Pacific is nothing but a big expanse of ocean at the size of one third of the globe. But if you zoom closer with the Google Earth, you'll find that the Pacific is made up of various small islands dotted around this vast expanse, which make up 19 nations and a few territories of other nations as well, excluding Australia and New Zealand and the state territories of US and France in the Pacific. There are 19 nations, as mentioned, which are either categorized small islands, developing country, or least developing country. Getting further closer, you'll find that the islands are dotted with sparse populations over these various small islands countries. And if we put all the islands together, it would form a land mass roughly about the size of France with a total overall population of over 8 million. So I think that's quite sizable. So without taking further ado, I hand over to our first speaker, Richard, from Palau, to talk further on this country, issues and typical setups, issues and uh, challenges. Thank you. Yeah, after um, uh, Richard will take us through the typical country characteristics and setups, the issues and challenges, uh, Mr. Praveen will follow on with the applications uh, of technology and some case studies done in the Pacific. Mm. And that will be followed by Maui Sanford uh, remotely who will start the discussions on opportunities. Then we'll give uh, the floor of comments and discussions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fred. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, let this crowd know that uh, in the islands, access is a very critical, very crucial part uh, of our connectivity. Uh, it's a means uh, not only for um, information sharing, but as well as the connectivity of lifeline for us. And um, on the following few slides, uh, I will show you the uh, various ways and issues we deal with in the Pacific Islands. Um, you know that um, it's, it's like the language I used to uh, greet you. Each island has its own um, um, uh, environment different from each other as you go across this vast uh, area of, 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 uh, of ocean. As far well as um, um, the population is, is very sparsely, uh, like Fred mentioned, you can take uh, the smallest group of island, Tokelau, 1,800 people to PNZ, which is about 6 million people. So it, it, it shows you a little bit of a, a diversity of different uh, challenges, issues that are faced when you go to each individual island group. Uh, and it, you know, basically is, um, starts from the least developed uh, uh, con island countries and developing countries with lack of skill resources and strong frameworks the lack of scale of economy to, to sustain uh, the needs and, and demands of the communities and the island nations, and funding, as well as what we uh, look for towards to make things happen is the communal bonding and responsibilities shared among all the stakeholders of each island group uh, in terms of resources, consolidation of resources, doing more with less, and trying to achieve what we need to provide for our people in accessing. So in, in access, uh, there's basically two uh, major uh, components of access. One of it is uh, basically the domestic part. And I will expand a little bit on that. And the other side, the other component is the international part, of which I will also mention some of it. Some of the, the characteristics on the domestic part are basically the last mile that 
enables the customers, the users, to interface to the infrastructure and the information highway. And, and that in itself uh, will include uh, new technologies such as fiber optic, VSAT, small aperture terminals, as well as WiMAX, as well as um, local loop, copper and wireless, broadband wireless, DSL, even HF, high frequency radios, and of course the fiber optic as well. In some, some of the developing island countries have uh, already in place uh, infrastructures for domestic network that provides them the advantage of fiber optic. When you go to the international side of, of uh, or the back hole side first before I go to the international, the same technology also uh, are present. Uh, to begin with, uh, fiber optic, VSAT satellite, WiMAX, microwave, copper, as well as coaxial cable, HF, and um, the wireless uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, microwave as well as um, high frequency radio. On the international side, we, we also have uh, deployed and, and utilize uh, what's available through the developed countries. Uh, VSAT with satellite, fi uh, submarine fiber optic for those countries that have it, as well as um, um, main gateway earth stations. The, uh, <clears throat> one of the component uh, or some of the uh, issues and challenges we have in, in our domestic um, activities in terms of access are the great reliance we have on satellite for international, rural, and outer island communications. And uh, the huge cost of to deploy and maintain the infrastructure and access to sparse populations. Basically, the access cost uh, that we have to maintain these services represent about 60 to 80 percent of all cost of operation. And on the last slide, you saw that that's due to the double hopping on satellite connectivity. And we have uh, you know, all kinds of flavors of different mixture of technologies employed, as I mentioned early, from wireless to wireline to a microwave, as well as radio, basic radio technology like HF. What we see is the growing deployment of wireless application versus wireline give us a challenge to, to to, to come up with more demand, more sites to be built. Now that people are very dependent, are carrying their wireless with them from the main island, when they go to their remote islands, they expect the service to work. And we have to you know, provide for that. The business case for the SL is also in the same uh, consideration. In the main uh, populated islands, we do have the commerce relying on this DSL service and broadband for their activities, their commerce activities. Now they have expanded, they want to have their remote office because there's a small commerce being developed in our islands. Now we have to build the same. And, and this is the challenge and the issues we face are duplication of these services and the investments. The small market issues are also some of our um, challenges and issues in terms of the sustainability and, and maintenance of these services. To be able to, to have the revenue to, to maintain it and, and make it uh, up, uh, affordable to the users. As well as the skills and, and maintaining the, and retaining the employees or the staff that are required to maintain the services. The universal service obligation imposed on the operators of most of the islands is also one of the component. And we have to work with the government assistance to make that happen, to make it, uh, uh, to get some sub type of subsidy so that those services can be extended to the outer islands. Uh, one of the um, items of, 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 of issue or challenge is the weak regulatory framework 
our policy framework due to the fact that we are too focused in making all this work together in connectivity and we have to invite our policy makers to be together in that direction to make what's, what's uh, applicable, what's, what is the best interest of, of the islands in terms of policy creation. And I will show in the next few slides some of the scenarios. And I, I have some slides from the Cook Islands uh, on the next slide. OK, th this, this shows the, um, the complexity of how some of these islands are connected and services are accessed. The orange um, links uh, depicts the domestic reliance of, or the domestic uh, connectivity of access from the satellite down to the main uh, island or commerce island and then back out to, for example, to the gateway to the outside world and the lighter, uh, the, the pink uh, um, colored and that's the double hop concept. You know how it is, you know, double hop in, 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 uh, creates latency. It creates um, all kinds of, 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 of challenges and issues for users and prohibits, um, prohibits a new business developments. And at the very end, it's also a very costly. Uh, next slide will also show a typical application in a group of uh, island of uh, French Polynesia. Uh, this is by an OPT slide that shows how, how complex it is. So, you know, it goes from the single typical two visa, one gateway air station to the Cook Island um, example, as well as more complex like the, this one we see now from the French Polynesia. And all of that are all subject to cost, subject to retention of those technologies, maintenance, you know, not to mention that even to go out and fix a site, for example, we have a, a typhoon or, um, or uh, some type of uh, natural disaster. When we go to repair or restore a service in an island, these islands are not typical islands with ports. You know, we have to put this expensive equipment on the boat, small 14, 16 footer speed boats, and go through the reef to make the shore so that we can put the service back online. And those challenges are very, very great um, because the, the people are already used to this. I mean, they're dependent on this for their livelihood and we have we, the universal service obligation. We need to put it back in place. And thus give us the issue and challenge of duplication as well. That equals to cost. Now we have to duplicate everything we do. We have to provide the redundancy, we have to have the sparing, and because we are very small, uh, size of, uh, of economy for the vendors, we are really nothing. It's very hard to get their attention, to pay attention to our needs, and to simply get a warranty equipment to go out for repair and under warranty, we sometimes takes us week, two weeks, just to get an RMA, return merchandise authorization to get a replacement. Now, once we get two weeks to do that, now we have to wait for shipment. Again, you know, the ships frequent these islands are not like based on a daily basis. I mean, they're talking about, we're talking about months. So all of that put together gives you a little bit idea of the, the, the issues we deal with are very unique. They're very unique to the developed countries and some of the developing countries. Some of the items we are, uh, we also look at, in terms of challenges, on the international side, is the, is the, um, the satellite bandwidth limit is limited and cost, limitation and cost. For example, um, the demand, the demand per user base in the islands is like any other developing country. Every day it grows. Per user demand grows exponentially, however, the subscription level is static. It, it, it's not, it doesn't go with the flow as much as we see in developing countries where we have the numbers to support these this, uh, advancements and these demands. Uh, the issue of double satellite hubs for rural and our other communications is another, another challenge. How do we make this so that we can put these resources in a, in a way that could benefit more 
in a simple statement, do more with less. How, we, how can we consolidate resources? How do we, at the same time, uh, provide for redundancy? At the same time, provide for the, uh, the cost of, 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 of maintenance and, and, and keeping the service at the level where demand is, is met. One of the uh, factors as well or element is the unfair char charging regime for internet. It's another inhibitor for making internet uh, uh, readily available to all the islands. It's all subject to cost. Um, the example is that we all know in, 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 the, in voice traffic exchange between carriers, we have certain level of, uh, of understanding or bilateral that each carrier meet its other halfway. That means we pay for half circuit and then we trade off traffic. Well, in the internet, it's not the same. In the internet, we have to pay for the full cost of both sides, the transmit and the receive capacity. And I will leave it to the floor to see if there's any um, you know, um, advice from anyone in that regard how we can deal with that. And I think it needs to be explored, it needs to be um, revisited. Perhaps uh, there will be a, an idea somehow that can be born out of, of discussions between groups, semi, I mean, um, regional groups, to think about how that can be uh, looked at. The love of, of, of link diversity, like I mentioned, to be able to maintain connectivity and access at the same time uh, make, make uh, the service affordable. I mentioned the growing demand for bandwidth, the consumption of bandwidth from peer to peer and spam. That's another thing, another issue or challenge. The, this spam and, and, and demand from peer-to-peer -peer and the capacity are not really, they don't really equal to revenue on our, on our side. They take away a lot of that very scarce and very costly capacity that we, we need to, to, to uh, make um, access readily available to all users. So we are challenged with how, how we will be able to segment the services we give to our customers and our communities considering all these issues. The restrictions to market and promote for demand thus increasing volume for better cost. That speaks for itself, like I elaborated earlier. I think the, some of the items of, or factors that we need to look at is how, how maybe there will be opportunities in these regards in, 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 in to, 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 make, to make all of this uh, become more cost affordable for the users and the communities in the island uh, countries. And with that, I will, the next slide will show you the cluster of, of all the technologies or access types and characteristics of how the islands are connecting to uh, uh, accessing uh, internet and services on the internet. Uh, you, you can take uh, from PNG all the way down to Norfolk, we're in the thousands down to the hundreds. And, and the delivery mechanism or the technology of delivery varies from local loop, dial-up, broadband, even GPRS, from country to country, island country to island country, it varies. Some of the countries are more st uh, stronger on one area and less stronger on others, but that, that shows the flavor, the flavor of different access that we need to be skilled enough to maintain. Right. Thank you, Richard. Uh, that's uh, to cover uh, on the country issues. And now we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Pravin Sharma, to speak on some of the technology initiatives and, uh, and case studies that uh, they've seen in the Pacific. Hello, everyone. Uh, in the next part of presentation, uh, uh, the broad agenda will be initially I will be cruising you through the concepts of VSAT technology, how the system works and how specifically they are beneficial for specific type of terrain. In the next part of the uh, presentation will be based on uh, 
the key issues and challenges uh, which we face in deploying satellite based or vsat based network in pacific region uh, in third part of uh, the presentation uh, we will be uh, dwelling upon few case studies to bring about uh, what are the uh, you know how international cooperation between the pacific, small pacific nations can actually help harness the advantage of uh, satellite based uh, networks for the common man living in those countries to start with uh, uh, vsat basically is an acronym of a very small aperture terminal vsats are used for providing voice and data networking over satellite media uh, vsat it was thought upon or generally used as uh, backbone or last mile connectivity options where no other conventional technology can reach or is you know economically possible to reach out to those places but uh, with the growing technology uh, and uh, prices exponentially falling down uh, this myth has broken and we said now takes on head on with other conventional technologies uh, in providing the, you know both backbone as well as the access part of the network uh, 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 telecom infrastructure requirements mm, uh, uh, satellite per se uh, uh, you know the vsat they are very specifically and optimally suited for pacific type of uh, uh, terrains wherein uh, you know as richard explained you pacific uh, there are small countries or small islands surrounded by pacific uh, oceans uh, these countries are widely geographically dispersed in specific region and uh, satellite uh, uh, you know by the sheer nature forms an optimal solution for catering or addressing the backbone as well as access requirements of these countries uh, the main advantage of vsat based networks are ubiquitous coverage uh, a vsat network is you know independent of geography so once the signal booms beams to the satellite each and every inch of the land which comes under the beam of or the contour area of the satellite can be covered or can be reached or can be provided the communication you know uh, uh, demand so uh, vsat per se are geographically independent they they have a ubiquitous approach uh, ubiquitous reach uh, then the second advantage of vsat based network specifically relevant in pacific region is high reliability because in vsat you have a dish antenna and electronics and signal directly beams on to the satellite there is no physical media or intermittent intermittent uh, electronics involved so since everything goes directly beams to the satellite directly on to the hub station or which is the master control station where entire tra traffic actually congregates uh, since there is no physical media involved uh, there are no chances of failures or the failures are minimum and hence the reliability of equipment is very very high unlike uh, you know fiber optic where in cable actually disconnect uh, you know each and every inch of the cable is susceptible for damage and wireless equipment wherein you have uh, base station or uh, base station controllers and you require general uh, di diesel generators and towers and coverage areas are problematic things so the next advantage for uh, mm, uh, vsats are quick deployability they can be deployed very fast uh, you need to just be you know uh, align the satellite dish to towards the satellite and then the 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 kiosks can be connected to the core network or to the backbone communication infrastructure the last and important point is since the reliability is very high and uh, deployability is fast uh, there is a low cost of deploying such network and the support cost is also lower as compared to other technologies Next. this particular slide uh, describes uh, a net typical network architecture of a vsat network uh, in uh, most of the vsat networks they work in star mode meaning you have kiosks or subscriber cpes which are vsats which are geographically dispersed over the entire coverage area and there is a master control earth station which is called as hub station you can see the big you know typically equipped with uh, big bigger dish 
uh, where entire now the signal beamed from remote station actually comes to the hub station the entire traffic from all the uh, cpes or vsats actually congregates at the central hub station from where it goes on to the uh, core network which is typically fiber optic cable going into the core infrastructure telecom infrastructure uh, while uh, star is the most popularly uh, popularly used uh, architecture mesh is also um, uh, used frequently uh, Uh, where in vsat one vsat or one kiosk directly talks to the other kiosk over the satellite link and initial call setup and tear down happens through the hub station uh, vsat uh, you know they uh, are typically used for different applications uh, uh, telephony providing village public telephone kiosk providing subscriber with telephone in, you know instruments so vsats are used for that vsats are used in access layers for providing broadband access uh, internet access to sme uh, sohos and uh, putting up uh, cyber cafes uh, that's on the access side vsat also is extensively used to provide and address the requirements of the backbone layer of the telecom infrastructure wherein the traffic from the access layers like wirenex or wireless is actually carried from one point on to the other point wherein the traffic is handed over to the core network uh, few applications are like uh, bts to bsc backhauls which are vsats are now new technology in the vsats are you know now used for vsats are also used for providing wirenex backhauls so vsats are widely used in pacific region for both backbone as well as access layer uh, communication requirements uh the next slide is basically uh typically do, you know it's trying to dwell upon what are the conventional frequency bands which are used in satellite communication in pacific region uh typically we use c band as well as k band in pacific region c band is more extensively used i will tell you why the main difference between c band and k band is in frequency bands c band is typically from 4 to 6 gigahertz k band is between 12 to 14 gigahertz c band uh being lower in frequency is lesser susceptible to rain fades because the rain is uh, rain fade or the rain attenuation in the link between the vsat and to the satellite is directly proportional to the square of the frequency and this the signal is transmitted so c band being lower in frequency than k band is less susceptible to rain fades Uh, uh is less susceptible to rain fade and uh uh, uh then k band then k band uh, you know uh, but the flip side is c band being lower in frequency the antenna size increases typical size of antennas which are used in pacific region are 2.4 and 3.7 meter so once the antenna size increases the corresponding logistic cost also increases the cost of installation increases the cost of uh, the equipment itself increases uh, but c band is more relevant in pacific region wherein which is uh, you know you have torrential rains almost every you know frequently so rainfall is a very big problem there and hence rain attenuation is a big problem so to overcome that uh, the c band is more you know more uh, uh, more acceptable or more uh, uh, friendly uh, to be deployed in pacific region uh, another advantage of c band is most of the satellite beams of c band are wider in nature you can see they can cover typically one third of a continent so well, once you have a c band specific being a geographically dispersed territory uh, c band coverage is usually available everywhere unlike k band which has got spot beams as i explained k band uh, uh, is from 12 to 14 gigahertz and has as the frequency is more the size of antenna reduces we we talk of typically 1.2 meter antenna sizes in k band so since the antenna sizes are smaller uh, and the uh, cost of equipment is also much lesser than c band uh, 
the since the size of the equipment reduces the logistic cost the uh, installation cost everything reduces but there is a flip side nothing comes as a free lunch the problem is as, as the equipment uh, uh, operates on higher frequency than c band 14 gigahertz range uh, they are more susceptible to rain fades the rain fades are much more higher in ku band than in c band so there are advantages of ku band but the disadvantage is that rain fades are much more higher in ku band as compared to c band uh ku band since uh, pacific region is mostly the ocean uh, land mass being very less as richard explained uh, and the region is very geographically dispersed not many satellite owners or operators found it uh, find it very lucrative to deploy or dedicate a beam of ku band over a pacific region so Uh, uh, there is a resistance, but there the things are changing. Uh, the, there is a recent entrant uh, G23, uh, which are, which provides spot beam coverages. Now K beam beam uh, K band being uh, higher in frequency, the beams are much more narrower than compared to you know uh, C band, which has got wider beam coverages. So satellite beams on K band are much more narrower, and hence, uh, but they are much more stronger. Uh, and hence uh, uh, satellite operators have tendency to uh, you know deploy these beams wherein they can get much more uh, business out of where density of the users is much more or density of the usage of such beams is much more so but ku beam coverage on g23 is now uh, available uh, in entire region in the next uh, part of the presentation uh, this was about till now we have discussed about what are vsat and satellite uh, technology uh, and why they are more relevant in pacific region what are the key advantages in the next part of the presentation we will be dwelling upon the key challenges which uh, operators and we as equipment vendors face in deploying vsat based communication network in pacific region the first problem is environmental uh pacific region uh, is basically a very hot and humid region most nations are basically island nations surrounded by oceans from all sides so weather is very sultry uh, and this results into the corrosion of electronics and corrosion of the equipments deployed in the field and hence the equipment has to be designed with such a material and such a technology that it can withstand the harsh environment uh, uh, of that particular region the ski the second uh, challenge which we face in pacific region is about logistics as richard mentioned that uh, you know uh, most uh, certain parts of these regions are only accessible by boats so the key challenge is to keep the technology or to use the technology which which can you know be transported in minimum possible weight and volume so that it can be easily taken up from one particular place to the other uh, so size of the equipment and the weight of equipment becomes very crucial this is another challenge the third challenge which we face is about project management uh pacific region you have to think about everything in advance so you need to plan your project you need to plan your do your project management in such a way that you actually uh, address even the smallest possible requirement of when you, you know so when you go to the field there is everything available with you to make the equipment online because uh, option of getting any kind of local support or local help is ne negligible so if you are not well prepared if you have not done your project management properly there are chances that project deployment will you know be delayed by considerable and significant time you will have to come back and take the equipment back onto the location which will take several days another challenge which we face in uh, pacific region while deploying 
technologies and you know any kind of technology is about training uh, most the cost of traveling is prohibitive in nature most of the you know many of the nation in the pacific region they are dependent upon donor countries for their economies to work and to encounter the cost of trainings sometimes becomes prohibitive and this actually results into poor installations and poor maintenance of the equipments which are uh, actually installed in very harsh environment in a very remote locations so the next uh, problem is attached to the training only uh, installation competence because there are there is uh, the training is very limited in nature the installations typically are not very good not very proper and they result into frequent problems frequent site visits which are very costly in nature which are very prohibitive in nature and uh, sometimes they may actually lead to the entire uh, cost of the project uh, to go for a toss support becomes very expensive in this region because to go to those sites and to replace the equipments which are faulty is a very tedious job a very costly job so the technology per se and we have got visa technologies which are very reliable in nature and which are designed to actually work in such remote and uh, you know far flung areas so it's very important to select uh, a technology and typically visa sites have gone to that particular level wherein they can actually provide very high level of mtbf and uh, uh, so that the cost the support cost of the project actually comes down very significantly and uh, 
you know, to, to keep the, the pace with the growing technology is a challenge in most of these nations in the Pacific region. Latency satellite per se are geosynchronous. They are located at 36,000 kilometers above equators. So there is inherent delay in satellite communications. Now, the technologies available today, and we said they have got accelerators which actually accelerate the TCP IP performance over delay sensitive satellite link so, so as to obviate the latency which is otherwise present in or inherent in satellite communications. Two bandwidth requirements, uh, you know, sometimes it uh, users think, uh, you know, uh, the expectations are very, very high. Sometimes people think that we, they require 2 Mbps without actually thinking whether 2 Mbps is required or the work can be easily done in 128 Kbps. So the expectations levels are very, very high and we face challenge in actually toning down these expectations because satellite bandwidth is precious in nature. Uh, in the last part of presentations, till now we have dwelled upon, uh, you know, in the second part of the presentation we were discussing about the challenges which we face in deploying satellite or any other technology in Pacific region. In the last part, uh, the, we have few case studies, there are two case studies, just to highlight how international cooperation between the Pacific nations has actually allowed countries to harness the advantage of uh, uh, the technology uh, for the benefit of common man. The first case study is about uh, Fiji Islands. Uh, in Fiji there is a hub station which is uh, located to provide uh, communication requirements for the VSATs in Fiji. But uh, there is another country called Vanuatu, and country has actually opened up and they have allowed to put up VSAT base at stations. They have actually uh, been uh, saying that they don't require a hub station to be based in their own country. So they are using shared up based services uh, out of Fiji hub station. And the next slide actually, uh, you know, uh, speaks more on that. So you have this hub station located in Fiji. You can see that. And then VSATs located in all over Vanuatu. Uh, and the gateway connectivity to the PS station is via one of the gateway VSATs located in Vanuatu itself. So the initial call setup for the VSAT to gateway call actually happens through the hub, but the hub's role is only allowed, really limited to uh, for billing and for uh, really allocation of satellite resources. So this is one example of how international cooperation between the small Pacific nations has allowed uh, one country to harness the advantage. The another case study is basically on RICS. RICS is basically a real internet connectivity system, uh, which is a uh, project initiated by Secretariat of Pacific Community and funded by Australian government for rural areas. Basically, the hub station is based in Honolulu and it covers the entire Pacific region. So the technology deployed is such that it covers the entire Pacific region for uh, uh, providing internet connectivity in rural areas in the entire Pacific region. So these are basically the two uh, case studies uh, which show if we come up, come above the petty uh, you know, small regulations, how we can harness the advantage of technology for the benefit of common man. Just summing up, uh, VSATs uh, earlier were thought of something, you know, which uh, which rich can afford. Now, the, the cost exponentially going down, technology becoming more and more robust, more technology becoming, you know, much more uh, uh, growing with the pace of the requirement of uh, conventional, you know, other technological requirement. Uh, our VSATs are now more suitable for both access layer as well as uh, backbone layer applications. Uh, VSATs, depending on the applications, are uh, you know uh, are able to deliver almost the th same throughput and same performance as other conventional technologies, and uh, they can be tailored to address the requirement of a particular uh, you know application. So just to sum up, uh, uh, till today, VSAT has. Uh, been uh, you know, successfully been able to address 
the communication requirement both in access layer as well as in abandonment layer in the Pacific region. And we believe that uh, with uh, regulations being opened up, the proliferation of technology will become more and more in the Pacific region. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Praveen. Um, we've spent uh, quite some time on satellite and especially on VSET uh, technologies because that could form one of a very good model uh, for the solution for the Pacific Islands as uh, Mr. Praveen has, has shown. Now, um, moving on from there, um, we'll get Maui from uh, Tahiti to, to discuss the opportunities. Um, is Maui on online? Okay, Maui, can you hear me? Maui, slide 25, yeah, it's I'm your turn now. Here. I need this audio line. Yeah. Is this audio line? Mr. Maui, uh, you can speak, we can hear you. Okay, uh, you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Okay, I'm on site 25, correct? That's right. Okay, uh, hello everybody again. I went through with uh, Sari, Fred, Vishan, and the presenter on the key issues for the Northern Pacific Island. I will try to focus on two aspects, which are affordability and access and optimizing resources and international collaborations. Uh, may I start first with what we say localizing content? Uh, we all think that you know we really need to connect everybody uh, in the Pacific um, by promoting local content creation. You provide. A, I mean, a use and it's useful for the uh, the population um, to uh, create their own content. Therefore, they use their own infrastructure more and more, and therefore there is also more chance to uh, create uh, local business opportunities for trading or even on culture uh, exchange locally, especially when you have a lot of rural communities. Uh, one key element for us is we only mainly talk about broadband, uh, mobile, fixed services, but video is starting to be a major uh, point of interest, uh, especially in local content creation. Uh, for example, in the Solomons, um, the Oceana Football Corporation has promoted the concept to have local uh, football matches being broadcasted and it's a huge success and this is just an example but really especially for the people that are far away from their from the cities it's uh, also very important to get local content uh, to work in their homes or also for public services so that's one point um, Having an exchange point, definitely uh, this is a kind of mutualization of all resources and the more the Pacific Islands are together at one point, especially on hubs and shared hubs like visa hubs or internet information points, then uh, price per unit will go down, especially when we talk about those small islands like Tokelau, Niue, and so on, as Richard and Fred have highlighted. So that's uh, one key element that uh, we want to promote and push forward. Aggregation. Uh, what is aggregation? Uh, we can also say consolidation. Um, these are words. That is, for example, uh, we have tried a lot, uh, we put a lot of energy in getting some things to be happening in the region, especially in terms of satellite capacity, uh, buying or uh, lease, uh, but together in a group. Uh, that's quite a 
uh, there are some, some hurdles, and the main one is how to deal with big companies uh, uh, in a group. And it comes to each company, it those big companies wants to have only one entity to be. So we are working with the World Bank and United Nations to find ways to create some kind of other joint venture, kind of what they call special vehicle, special purpose vehicle, to hold, uh, you know, responsibility to uh, deal with major supply companies. This is a practical case, and we are quite uh, positive on the on, on fulfilling our objectives. Um, yeah, classified technologies, minimum technology. Definitely, we we need, especially again when we come to small communities, uh, and you know we don't have to exclude uh, also very basic technologies as we go along. It ranges from you know wire mass satellite broadband to uh, HF radio. Let's say HF radio still have uh, uh, use in the Pacific, so all of those. Technologies really are uh, very useful to the population in the Pacific. And uh, really, the example of uh, Visa uh, combined with wireless broadband is, uh, I mean, what is really pushing connectivity and access to the countries. And thanks to the manufacturers and industry to really try to ways to provide uh, equipment which are affordable, of course, when you can negotiate it uh, all together, and uh, with also quality and performance. Uh, yeah, mobile. Mobile is going fast as everywhere. We have seen in many Pacific Island countries that mobile uh, go, we have more mobile users than fixed or less a trend, and easy deployment. Um, when you move on to internet or broadband mobile, that's another trick and that needs to have very costly investments. So when the population is very low, there is no uh, way that they could have 3G mobile services over there. So, but there are alternatives like WiMAX uh, deployment combined with Wi-Fi which have uh, much better, uh, you know, financial model. Uh, but this needs to be pushed, and uh, it's very uh, a, a major trend for enhancing connectivity in the Pacific. Of course, I won't go too much. I mean, the whole conference on IPF is on that one. Dynamics, dynamics of IP-based technology. Definitely, we think it can bring costs down. Uh, if we all go around the same protocol. Uh, however, just have in mind that when we talk about new generation networks, uh, IP networks, we have found just a few months ago, we were in Sydney for a workshop on this topic, that the key point was uh, we have found that uh, the major providers were targeting big markets we still have some providers who try to accommodate those big recommend to small countries. However, the cost of entry to uh, start to move to NGM uh, is very hard again for small countries. Some of them will only be moving to NGM if a few countries are together and linked together via satellite or via cable. But uh, most likely, the satellite will be used uh, mainly for rural communities. In fact, if I change schemes, that's open, but we really need to be very close with industry, and uh, we try in Peter to really work all together with the industry and the operators uh, in the region. Uh, but there are some ways uh, to really bring the price down uh, in order to really uh, minimize and, and minimize and you know maximize the networks and resources. Okay, um, let's move on. Yeah, international collaborations. Uh, 
the basic identifications association has 25 members of operators and 22 Pacific Islands, uh, uh, 22 Pacific Islands with 68 associate members. We um, can only, you know, contribute to development of the ICT in the region by international collaboration. Uh, we have uh, worked all together with major bodies like Epinic, ICANN, ITU, and so many other uh, organizations in order to really try to channel our efforts. For one goal, how can we improve connectivity in the region uh, and also what's going around in order uh, for each country to have their own uh, development schemes. So, uh, there are some initiatives from manufacturers and suppliers uh, for very small resilient solutions. Uh, that's one uh, aspect that really needs to be promoted. Let's come again to uh, the unfair charging regime. Uh, Richard have given uh, you know, what we experience mainly in the Pacific Island. We cover all the costs for our interconnection to the outer world. That includes, you know, all the way down to the door uh, of the big, uh, you know, worldwide web interconnection points. That was the case in telephony, uh, but now on a much bigger scale, it's on the internet. So that's one thing really that uh, impacting a lot mainly the uh, dropping economies in the Pacific, which again, uh, and we we'll need to be realistic, the gap between these countries and the modern world, I would say, will still be there. Um, and I will finish with technical and financial assistance. Again, uh, if we want to fill the gaps and the digital divide from all those countries in the Pacific, towards the world, but also between those countries in the Pacific. Uh, we really are pushing uh, to get technical and financial assistance to uh, all these countries, um, mainly uh, in projects where we think that there is a viability and uh, a long-term impact. Okay, with that, uh, thank you for your attention. and. Uh, I will now invite for comments, questions, and ideas to the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Maui. Um, as uh, Maui mentioned, um, it's time now for the floor to, to ask questions or contribute to some ideas that we can adopt for the Pacific Islands. And um, we have uh, 20 minutes to do that. Uh, feel free to ask any questions.